Willkommen in einem anderen Afrikans Video. Oh, welcome to yet another exciting video. In this case, part 14 of my battle series of videos, which in this case will cover the Battle of Plataea. This was a battle fought between the Persians and a Greek army in 479 BC. The video is mainly focused on looking at the battle from a figure gaming point of view, which includes order of battle, troop types, and the flow of the battle. So if you wish a big picture of why the battle was fought, then this may not be the video for you. But if you want to know about the actual battle, then continue to view on. Finally, after doing several videos where I had basically no historical references, I'm actually covering a battle with some reasonable historical references. So my guesswork will be reduced and you'll be able to put your salt away, or at least a part of your salt away. However, as with most ancient battles, uh, we do not have an enormous amount of historical references, even for this battle, and some, some guesses are required. The picture uh, shows us a possible location of the battle, and what I find interesting is that it's reasonably flat, uh, which is probably why the Persians withdrew to this area, so they could give their cavalry uh, their maximum chance of manoeuvring. Let's now start with uh, my drill down into the Greek army. Our main source for both the battle and both force mixes is Herodotus, who does provide a reasonable account of um, the battle and some background information. Now let's start with the easiest troop type on the Greek side, the hoplites. These are the values of hoplites by nationality based on Herodotus. Now, they're generally regarded as reasonable, and the total here is about 38,700 hoplites, so we have no reason to believe that this is not accurate, although there obviously is some rounding occurring. Where we have most of the issues with Greek army is the number of light troops, which according to Rodotus totaled 69,000. Now, we can be confident there were 800 Athenian archers, but the total of 69,000 does seem outrageously large. Now, the Greeks fought a naval battle at the same time, which would have required as many, of th many as 36,000 men to man the fleet. It seems like this should be subtracted from our 69,000 men. Now, the other, this still leaves us with an awful lot of um, light infantry, and most of them would be the helots, which the Spartans brought along. Now, there, according to Herodotus, were seven helots per hoplites. Now, most historians feel most of these were used for logistic purposes rather than supporting the battle itself. Now, I'm uncertain what the actual number of light troops were concerning the size of the Persian army. You know, considering how large the Persian army was, I suspect there must have been a reasonable number of supporting light troops, but I'm really not sure how many. If the Athenians sent 8,000 hoplites and 800 archers, perhaps the other Greeks had a similar ratio. Thus, we could have maybe 3,600 light uh, skirmishes or light infantry available to the Greek army. Let's look at some other force mixes to see if this is roughly correct or not. Now if we look at the Lost Battle force mix, uh, we can possibly get some rough idea of how many light troops were present, at least according to this book. Using the hoplites as our guide, we are looking at about 2400 archers and 4800 helots in total. This still is, well, it's a larger number than my 10% number that I mentioned earlier, but still seems uh, rather low and probably too many archers, but it's possible. Let's look at another game, uh, the SPI pre-stags board game. We actually see a similar low number of skirmishes, even less than lost battles. Although in pre-stags, quality is reflected by the number of units, so we could be seeing a larger number of low-quality skirmishes here. So based on uh, these data points, and I must admit some of them are quite shaky, uh, this is my best guess of the Greek army. Again, as I indicated before, the main area of confusion really is the light troops, but these numbers that I've indicated here could be reasonable. Perhaps most of the helots were simply there to carry supplies. Um, I'm uncertain, but it's unlikely that um, there were you know, 30,000 helots running around um, the Greek army during this battle. I think the number that we've got here, which is 800 archers and 6,400 javelmen, is probably a reasonable upper limit of the amount of light troops the Greeks had at the battle. Let's now look at the DBMM army list to see what kind of troop types we should be considering on the Greek side. 
We know the Athenians had 800 archers on the battle. Now, there may have been more archers from other cities, but as they were specifically mentioned, perhaps they were unique, and these were the only archers that the Greek possessed in the battle. Now we come to other light infantry, which we have to assume would be javelmen. Now, I'm assuming there are 6,400 uh, javelmen, based on my interpretation of the loss of battle's force mix. Other sources indicate this number should be less than this, but I kind of feel, and, and that's quite possible, but I kind of feel that 6,400 is a good upper limit for the Greek army, and considering that we're dealing with a rather large Persian army, probably quite reasonable. Now, of course, the bulk of the Greek army consisted of hoplites. Um, in the most part, it would be irregular spearmen, ordinary quality. However, the only exception to this would be the 10,000 hoplites from Sparta, which in this army list are classed as superior and regular. Now it's time to cover the Persian army. Herodotus provides us with a total of 300,000 men, which is simply too great. Most historians estimate the army was probably closer to 100,000 men. Now I'm not going to try and um, make any attempt at interpreting what the numbers should be. I'll simply accept the values contained in wiki, um, which is something I normally consider as rather dangerous, uh, but I suspect that in this case that uh, the numbers uh, are reasonable and um, generally accepted by most historians. Now, the Persian army consisted of about 40,000 Persian troops on the left of the battle line facing the Spartans, about 20,000 Bactrians, Indians and Sake in the centre facing various Greek states, and about 20,000 Greek allies, um, you know, such as Macedonians, Sicilians, Boeotians and Thebians, positioned on the right flank facing the Athenians. The cavalry, which uh, also consisted of Persians, Bactrians, Indians and Sake, would total about 5,000 men. Now, the only thing that I've inserted here is that the uh, smaller contingent uh, that you see um, fourth from the top, that number should be 15,000. If you add everything, subtract it from the total, it comes up to 15,000. I'm not quite sure where they didn't put the word 15,000 in there. This gives us the big picture of the Persian army, but does not really give us a breakdown of the troop types. Now, what I'm assuming is that the first three boxes represent the left, centre and right flanks of the Persian army, and these generally consisted of heavy and medium troops. The next group of 15,000 men, you know, such as Thracians, Maesian, the Ethiopians, etc., they represent the skirmishers, and there were approximately 15,000 skirmishers which probably seems reasonable. And then, of course, finally we get the cavalry. Now, this is a rather broad brush uh, breakdown of the troop types, but um, trying to drill down to any greater detail here is not going to, you know, not going to give you much uh, credible information. I think uh, in this case, we're better off just trying to paint the simplest uh, brush possible. And I think overall you end up with a reasonable result. Let's go back to our trusty DBMM army list and look at the troop types and what they looked like in each of these groups that you just saw in the previous image. Now the Persians had 5,000 cavalry, which, which were probably standard Persian medium cavalry. It's possible there may have been some light horse, but their numbers probably were low. In the army list, the Persians can field 12 elements of cavalry, which at a scale of 200 mounted per element totals 2,400 cavalry. If we add all the possible light cavalry and Theban cavalry, which can boost this up to 4,800 mounted. If we add a mounted sub-commander, we can get to the 5,000. So while it's possible to field 5,000 cavalry using the DBMM army list, it clearly it was not designed to field an army of this size. As a result, um, you know, I would uh, assume that the ratio is not 200 men uh, per element, and it's a higher ratio, and as a result, my assumption is that the vast bulk of the cavalry were actually medium cavalry and that the light horse was only a small contingent, if present at all. Now, if we look at the uh, Persian wing, which was the Persian left flank, uh, the bulk of the Persian army consisted of this troop type, the Spartabara foot, and this probably would total uh, 40,000 Persians, which seems like a very large number, but considering we're assuming the Persian army was 100,000, quite reasonable. 
Now, the Persians have, um, in various smaller detachments, 15,000 troops, which is what I'm considering is basically their skirmish formation. As a result, within this 15,000 man grouping, um, we would assume some of these troops would be used. I'm assuming that as much as 8,000 of this 15,000 would consist of what you see here, which is Armenians, Papagonians, Caspians, um, Parthians, Bactrians, Scythians, etc., which would primarily be uh, bowmen, uh, skirmish bowmen, and even some auxilia, aux you know, um, irregular auxilia. And finally, in the skirmish area, the remaining light troops probably are javelmen, as you see here, which could compose up to 4,000 foot, according to the DBMM army list, if not more. Where I have the uh, biggest issue is the uh, troops in the centre, which are supposed to be Indians and Bactrians, etc. Now, we can certainly have Indian foots, although this implies the numbers are not great, and the Bactrian foot, which are bowmen in this example, are not exactly what I'd consider as medium or heavy troops. In both cases, the total numbers are not great, according to the DBM army list. The Saki, which are you know, equally light and bow-armed, could also be added to this number, but it's not what I would probably consider to be the type of troops that I would field in the centre. Basically, I, I personally think that most of the central troops, the Indians and Bactrians and the Scythians or Sakians, are more medium variety troops, possibly very similar to the Spatabara. Now on the right wing we have our 20,000 Greek allies and they would be basically a mix of all these troops, troop types so ranging from Thebians, Sicilians, um, um, other Macedonians, etc. This comes from the wiki site and also other sites, they get the map from the other sites and it shows the initial movement at the Battle of Plataea. The Greek line moves forward to the Asopus Ridge this shows the same initial deployment, in this case by Sophia Tiu from the University of Toronto, Department of Classics. Dr. Sarah Murray is also credited, and this provides a rather good view of the initial positions of both sides. There is a PDF uh, where you basically have an initial force, and I suspect some rules for a game to, re to allow you to reproduce this battle, which I find quite interesting. I'm just using the maps from it. This shows the same start position of the battle, but it shows you the various Greek right flank, which is Spartans, Greek left flank, which is Athenians, etc. This shows the initial stage of the battle and the Persian attack pathways, which the Persian flanks would have followed as they went after the retreating Greeks. Once both sides had engaged and the Greeks finally defeated the Persians, this shows the Greek attack paths and the final assault on the Persian camp. Let's go back to Wiki. This shows the main phase of the battle. For logistics reasons, the Greeks decided to withdraw. The Greeks' retreat becomes disorganised and the Persians decide to cross the river to attack the Greeks. Most historians felt the Persians did not really wish a battle. They just needed to outweigh the Greeks and allow the Greek alliance to fall apart. It was this Greek retreat which gave the Persians the impression they could actually win a battle, thus precipitating the actual battle itself. Now this shows maps from the map archive. Uh, the map on the left, left corresponds to the last image, which shows the Persian attack, and the map on the right is the final Greek counterattack. Let's drill down into this in a little bit more detail to try and understand actually what occurred during the battle. Once the Persians had discovered the Greeks had abandoned their defensive position and appeared to be in retreat, the Persians decided to set off in immediate pursuit with the elite Persian infantry primarily and also I assume the cavalry. And the rest of the Persian army, then unbidden, according to Herodotus, began to move forward. The Spartan right flank, uh, had the bulk of their forces, had now retreated to the Temple of Demeter. However, the rearguard formation, which was holding back the Persians, was under enormous pressure by the Persian cavalry, and they began to request assistance. Now, at the same time, the Athenians had been engaged by the Theban, Thebans on the Greek left flank, and unfortunately were unable to assist the Spartans 
Now I'm not quite sure what occurred in the centre, they don't really talk much about it, but um, I'm assuming it's the story there is very similar to the Spartans. Now the Spartans' um, right flank were first assaulted by Persian cavalry, and it was these troops that caused such difficulty with the regard formation, while the Persian infantry slowly made their way forward. Once they had moved within a bow range, they planted their shields and began shooting arrows at the Greek, while the cavalry withdrew. Now, after waiting for what seemed like a, an inordinate time period under Persian arrow fire, the Spartans decided to advance and charge the Persian lines. Now, the numerically superior Persian infantry were of the heavy, by Persian standards, Spartabara formations, but this is still much lighter than the Greek phalanx. The fight was fierce and long, but the Greeks continued to push into the Persian lines. The Persians tried to break the Greek spears by grabbing hold of them, but the Greeks responded by switching to swords. Now, while this was all occurring, the Persian commander was killed by the Spartans, and after this occurred, the Persian line collapsed. So basically, the interpretation here is the Spartans contacted the Persians, forced the Persians back. Uh, the Persian commander probably went into the front line to rally his troops and during this moment was killed by a Spartan, command, Spartan soldier and the line, that is the Persian left flank, then collapsed. Now on the opposite side of the battlefield, the Athenians had triumphed in a tough battle against the Thebans. Now the Thebans withdrew in a different direction and thus avoided the heavy losses of the Persians. I'm uncertain what occurred in the centre. According to the map, the centre advanced against the Persians as rapidly as the Spartans, so I would probably group that in the same group. Thus, the battle tended to be probably in two parts. Uh, the Greek right and centre formation was basically the main battle, and then you had almost an auxiliary battle on the Greek left flank, which was when the Athenians were fighting the other Greek troops. Now, Herodotus seems to imply the... Um, Greek allies of the Persians didn't particularly fight very aggressively, and their losses were low, and they ran off in a different direction. So um, maybe this is one reason why the battle was in such a, a separate uh, part, uh, why it was so divided in this way, and why it occurred in this particular manner. Now the end part of the battle was of course the Spartan, and I assume the Greek centre, assaulting the Persian camp. According to Herodotus, there was initially ferocious fighting, but in the end, the Greeks managed to enter the camp and slaughtered vast numbers of Persians. Now, one thing that I find interesting about this battle is the width of the battlefield is rather great, being probably greater than 3,000 metres long, according to this map, which could explain the lack of cooperation between the Greek and right and left flank. Now, I'm not actually creating a new scenario for this. I'm actually using the SPI pre scenario, although I will be redoing the map because I don't particularly agree with the SPI map. However, um, I'm converting all this into a DBMM troop type. So this shows a possible force mix for the battle using the SPI pre force mix, which is not exactly the force mix that I've indicated in this video. It has a lot less light troops than I'm assuming. Now this has been converted into DBMM troop types and the DBMM army list point system. While this does use the DBMM points values, there is a slight modification for certain types of leaders, as I'm using this for the uh, pre-17th century wargaming rules, which is basically pre stags and this requires some slight difference between commanders. For example, under pre stag the Persian commander is better than the Greek commander, and I tend to agree with that. Now, this only changes things by a couple of points either way, so you could still use these points for a pure DBMM game. And I think actually in this case, unlike all the other videos I've created, this may actually make for an interesting game. Because what we've got here is a Greek army of 280 points against a Persian army of 285 points, and this makes for a very even battle. Now, of course, the problem is how do you duplicate this battle? Because basically it only occurred because the Greek withdrew. They, were, they seemed disordered. The Persians then thundered across to attack and basically um, you know, lost the battle accordingly. Now, of course, you could simulate this, but you'd need some pretty ferocious victory conditions in order to simulate it, which would basically force the Persians to go screaming ahead at a particular point of the battle. Anyway, these are things that you can create in special rules. 
And so we come to a close of my port 14 of my military history video covering yet another battle of the Great Persian Wars, probably the largest and most important one. Alle guten Dingen kommen zu einem Ende.